Man, ever I say, my pen dream TV. Pen dream TV, dear. I see them. Yopo. My guest today, actually, needs no introduction. He's a man that we've all encountered in different ways, different facets of our lives. But for the sake of formalities, I shall introduce him. He's a business mogul. He's a statesman, as some would describe him. He's been there, done that, faced the rough tide of life. And today I've caught him chilling. Cool, cool air. He was just chewing ground nuts <laughs> before we got uh, here on air. Um, if you've not guessed yet, I'm talking about Captain Prince Kofi Amwabe retired. He joins me today for a conversation. Thank you for joining <laughs> me. You have to talk about the ground <laughs> I, had to, I had to bring in the ground I mean, It was so cool the way you took things oh, yeah, easy. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. Uh, I see you take life very, very easy. You don't, you don't fuss about it. You don't stress about life. No, if you know you've been blessed, then you're only looking for how to return the blessing. So you don't fight hard. There's nothing for you to really fight for. Mm -hmm. It's a matter of living a life that depicts the appreciation of what your creator has done for you. Right. Nowadays, I'm becoming like a pastor. Man. People say, I want to be an hour in <laughs> Has there been any switch in that regard? No, 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 no. I no, mean, no. you know, Lord Kenya, secular music at a point became. No, no. We've no. had those transitions. It's like I've always been a Christian. And it, my. my upbringing was in deep Christianhood. My grandmother, my mother, and I started going to church at the age of maybe four and a half, five. And I wake up every morning, they take me to church, and I would dance, and I would be by the sofa. And then, you know, Presby, when you, you go to church, by the time you finish church, everyone greets everybody. And to show that it was a new life. So really, I have been a Christian, but in my own way, so people say I don't go to church. I go to church. I go to church when there's a funeral or when there's a wedding I have to attend. And then I believe to my God the way I think I should. So I'm going to push you a bit. Do you go to church at Easter, Christmas, New Year? No, no, no. You don't. Those are the good days to play golf, incidentally. <laughs> <laughs> That's a, an interesting sneak peek. Uh, there are so many matters we want to discuss with you, but let's start with some of what you've been up to. And you have this foundation you've started. You're impacting yes, the thank lives you. of many young people. Tell us about it. What's the name of the foundation? PK Amwabin Leadership Foundation. Okay. And I started that foundation because if I'm not, if I don't sleep well in the night, the only thing I think about is the state of the state, mm. as in the state of Ghana. And it's a story that I tell people that, you know, when I was growing up, my father told me that his father, whom I was named after, did not believe in independence for the black man, that blacks could not govern themselves. Mm. And when he was about to die, he called my dad and said, come and disprove what I'm saying, so I'll be waiting for you for your confirmation or otherwise. So when my father was going to die, he called me and said, Kofi, your grandfather said this, and I'm going to tell him that. He was right, but I should wait for you, because by your time, Ghana would have changed. I've told my son the same as I sit here. Wow. Now, I don't want to just go and tell them this sad situation, but I want to tell them at least I have started something to change the narrative. So, to the Leadership Foundation, what I decided to do with my life, whatever is left of it, is to bring up young people with the right values and attitudes, and our vision is a revolutionized mindset for the African leader. Because everything is about leadership. Mm. And if you don't have the right leadership, as we don't have, we shouldn't expect anything good to happen to us. Now, everybody, statesmen, leaders, all talk about the mindset, mindset, mindset. It's okay to talk to the youth about experiences and what they need to do and values. Some will take it, some may not take it, but when they see hardships in reality, that's their real life, it's difficult for them to say that they say we should do the right thing. So what I have done with the PKM Wabin Leadership Foundation is to form PKM Wabin scholars. I'm trying to create, not just tell them, but create the kind of leaders who can cause change in leadership positions. Um, the thing is, I, I 
Do I have hope? Yes. It's like puts casting thy bread upon the waters. Just maybe we can get one of them who has been and he built a hospital, he connected the roads, he's, 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 uh, he's created the neatest town in Ghana for sure. Uh, uh, his kingdom, so to speak, which is really in the middle of nowhere. And he's built a fantastic first class palace, he says the biggest palace in Africa maybe. And he's built a hospital, he connected the roads, he's, he's, uh, he's created the neatest town in Ghana for sure. That's massive. Yes. Maybe the president can learn a thing or two from him in a terms lot, of making a crowd clean the city. A lot, a lot, a lot, not, not, not a thing or two. And now his aim is to create the, 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 the nicest town. And you go and see the effort is putting. Kusha itself. Kusha itself. Mm. So I took my scholars there, he invited us, and he had time for us. He spent over three hours in the morning sitting with us, sharing his experiences and what Ghana could become. Right. Hosted us for dinner and everything. And we all, we all, we all awed, overawed with, with, with the, his, his ideas, his experiences, the way he's down to earth, the way he respects and cares for his people and everybody for that matter. And those are the leaders that we have to pick up and let the youth associate with them and network with and everything. So the scholars, I'm trying to create leaders. Another way I look at it is that I'm trying to clone people like me who look at things, not fear another human being. Fear God by all means. Respect everybody. Be honest and have integrity at all times. Be committed to serving people and so on and so forth. Because really, this world is not about all the material things that are around. It's about what we can do to improve the world for us. And that is missing, missing uh, for most of us. That's some fantastic work you're doing. But I'll ask you this. Ghana is 67. What is wrong with our leadership mindset? Initially, you were talking about values, attitudes that you want to inculcate in them. And you went on to suggest, almost, you could clarify, that we didn't have leaders. Do we have leaders? Of course we have leaders. We choose leaders, and they are leaders. Mm. But we choose our own kind. And we've unfortunately arrived at a situation where we have what we call democracy, which is supposed to be the best form of governance. And we are practicing it. But this democracy um, makes me feel hopeless about this whole situation. Why? It will never give us a good leader. Never. This democracy? Yeah. As we have it, it in Ghana? It will not give us a leader that can change Ghana. Because the issue is, by the time the leader gets into position, he's been corrupted already. Mm. He owes too much money, too much favors. He owes the party. He owes individuals. He, and, and, and then our constitution also makes him too powerful to really satisfy all these people that he owes. For example, the president appoints or approves of about 6,000 appointments. And he has to make sure that all his people get MCs, MCs, MC, SOEs, ambassadors, IGP. Uh, board members, uh, CEOs. You know. And so the way of awarding this po the position to people too is that it's about who has served me or who can serve me. I mean, somebody wins election primary, so he's going to parliament and he gets a CEO appointment. That's quite recent. So you ask yourself. I know what you're talking about. Yeah. Do you have problems with that, though? I have problems with it. I have problems with a whole lot of appointments. Mm. I mean, I don't want to be mentioning names, but the people appoint, people get appointed not because they know the subject, not because they have the expertise and the experience. It's because they are serving the powers that be. So it's not about merit. Actually, it's about mediocrity. And these guys go, because they know they don't know, then they become pompous and cover their uh, shortcomings and things, and disrespect people. So um, talking about leadership, we have a long, um, that's why I'm trying to create 
the kind of leaders who will say that we need to put systems in place. We need to respect everybody. And you work with systems, not with some powerful chiefs, not with powerful uh, uh, pastors, not with family and friends, because we're talking about Ghana. So let the systems work. And it's not difficult if the systems are working to be a leader. Because they take Max Zuckerberg. Then, as you sit here, you should be a better leader than him. He only found a product or service that we enjoyed, but the systems were there to support him. Yeah. So he's a multi-billionaire CEO. But you find something which we want. We will cut you down. And you can't become the kind of leader that potentially you can become. And they know a channel. They know you're not going to. To know. When we are, you know. So um, it's a tall order. But at least I will jibe at it and, and see what happens. If you could change one thing about Ghana today, 67 no. years on, but in this fourth republic now, what would it be? I'll change the president. You'll change the president? Yep. Wow. And probably I'll put Kushia chief as president. <laughs> I was about to ask you, do we, do we have the alternatives? Oh, we do have, we do have a few people, but I see they've been called on um, and we acquire or what effect. There are a few people who are, who are like me. They, we, me, I, I thrive in controversy. I don't care what people do. I want to do the right thing that right. I believe is right. right. And take it or leave it. I mean, as you speak, I'm in court. So I shouldn't even be sitting here, <laughs> shooting my mouth, and, uh, oh, yeah, this, yeah, that. But it is what it is. You can't take it for, away from me. You know. let's, let's talk about the state of the nation. One of the things everyone has been talking about, because it impacts everybody, do so. <laughs> power outages. In fact, <laughs> when we came here, and I'll not mention where we are, we realized the, the plant or the generator yeah. was on, yeah. making a lot of noise. When I was coming here from work, yeah. we had our systems on because the power was off. Then you have the situation where the Food and Beverages Association of Ghana, because you are into business, um, the Ghana Publishers Association, all of them are complaining about power outages and the cost of doing business. As a business mogul, when you look at that and look at what is happening, what do you see? Where are we getting it wrong? Uh, I think it cuts across all sectors. And the government is very short of delivering what the people want, or the people put them there for. Um, I was talking about Kushia. To go to Kushia is about 217 kilometers. It will take you about five hours, if you are lucky. If Kaswa decides to misbehave, it will take you seven hours, eight hours for 200 kilometer distance. So we failed in roads, we failed in hospitals, we failed in education, we failed in health, we failed... Let, let me take you on, on two points. Roads, you mentioned roads and education. Everything. We have free SHS, which has been highly touted. Roads, <laughs> even in, in recent times, again, we've been told that no administration has done the sort of oh, work yeah, this administration yeah, has done when it comes no, to no, roads. How, how can you be saying this? Please, please, Aren't please, you seeing the roads? Please, please, Aren't please, you seeing please. the impact on are education? Are you seeing the roads is the question <laughs> I should ask you. All roads that are under construction have come to a halt. Why? Mm. Because the government has come to say it can't pay foreign uh, uh, financiers, yeah. it can't even pay the local ones, and they have to take haircut and armpit cut and uh, all sorts of things. Mm -hmm. So you find that all roads are at a standstill, or they're going at a very slow pace, because we can't raise the money. And we, a whole lot of things account for it. Cocoa prices have gone down because of the volumes have gone down. Uh, that's the main uh, source of foreign exchange. Uh, Bank of Ghana is owing, what, 600 and something billion. When they call the figure, you even don't understand. Mm -hmm. And, you know, uh, 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 the king, uh, uh, over, over 60 billion, if I Yeah, uh, uh, the king, um, uh, so great king, Tobi uh, Afedi, yeah. said, made a statement which captures exactly the mess in which we have with Bank of Ghana expenses so balloon that they have to keep interest rates high and so on and so forth. And the corruption that we see and feel, and the disrespect and the arrogance of those in power. I mean, it's, it, it, made, it made Ghana not a nice place to be, but this is the only land that we have. So we have to do our best about it. In the midst of all of that, we want to attract foreign direct investment. We want to attract businesses. And you do know, I don't need to list all of them. The Glovos, the Jumias, the Lipton Tees, many of them, about eight of them, have up to oh, it's left. reached eight. 
I'm, oh, yes. I'm, I knew only about six. But there are eight of them. I yeah. could actually give you a few. You know, and they are citing different metrics in our economy. Right. Can all, we stem the tide of that? It all, it all boils down to mismanagement of the economy. Uh, mismanagement in all sorts. If I should stick to my sector as in the finance sector, there was a cleansing of the financial sector. And we used 25 billion government figures. That was about $6 billion. And after using $6 billion to cleanse the banking system, we were left in a situation where we had to go and beg IMF for $3 billion. I mean, really, who does that? And I, I bet that the government could have done the, the cleansing in any form they wanted with about half that amount at best. So it's raw mismanagement. So you think, you think even in cleansing, even in the banking sector cleanup, there was, they messed there up. was a mess? Because there's, a, there's a bit of hatred, jealousies, not investigating clearly and so on and so forth. But I don't want to talk about that because it would be like, okay, so his bank was taken and therefore he's bitter. You don't do things like that. When banks are having problems, you investigate and bail them out. And they, they, they thrive and survive and come back and pay the loans that they're supposed to pay. And it happened in the US in 2008 with bigger banks. Yeah. And we did a process and took a process which cleared the indigenous banks, so giving the country for the, the foreign banks. Who does that? A lot of things, I can't even explain. So I ask myself, maybe I'm a bit crazy, because how can anybody think that way about his own country? And the country is virtually in the hands of foreigners. And we're losing our cocoa farms due to Galamsey, which is not being checked. For goodness sake, the president is commander in chief of armed forces, is head of the police, it has got, uh, uh, what do you call it? GRE to collect our money for them, got customs to check everything. So you have the money, you have the men, you have the ammunition, you have the control, your commander in chief, and nothing can happen. I tell you, I can't believe it. That we can't stop Galaxy. Who's there who can't stop Galaxy? We have a whole armed forces at this point with helicopters and drones and everything. And you can't stop Galaxy. Maybe the fight is bigger than that because it's also economic, mind you. And the president, mind you, at a point. So, I think this was in 2017. He put his presidency on the line. If seven years down the road, he's not been able to tame the menace of Galamse, what does that tell you? It, maybe Galamse is bigger than the president? But he made too many promises. Accra will be the cleanest city in Africa. Uh, Ghana will be whatever and so and so forth. The tourist attraction. None of them has materialized. And we now still have leaders who are also promising or over-promising similar things, which won't happen or can't happen. I mean, someone said we should look at the rail, rail from Accra to Lagos. Oh, for goodness sake, since uh, Tamil's time and Kufo's time, we only are able to do Accra to Tema, which breaks down. The one that we wanted to uh, uh, launch or something like that, somebody put a truck on the way from an accident. <laughs> the promises, you know, it's as if we don't ha even have sense. So I don't listen to Ghana news nowadays. I'll pr probably take the graphic or something, flip through, to see the news items that are not insulting, and then I close it and put the rest down. Because I think they tell you, it tells you that you are stupid. So it's raw mismanagement. And to cause a change, it's not difficult. It comes from one person, the leader. The leader makes sure the systems are working, and he leads by example. Let me give you a simple as uh, We're all irritated about why we don't keep time and this and that. If the president should decide that he is going to keep to time for all his appointments and sanction his immediate subordinates if they are late, like to keep them out of meetings, it will not take two weeks for Ghanaians to realize that time is important. But I see presidents who are late two hours. The state is taking care of you completely. You have your convoy with sirens when you are going for appointment, appointment and we have to pack because you are the president and go on time to take decisions that will affect our lives. And then you are late two hours. And when you are late two hours, if you no know apology, it simply means they don't respect us, period. And it's sad. So with, with, with these sorts of promises that are being made now, you said maybe it's in vogue because the more you promise, well, the more likely, you promise, yeah. the more promise and, and bribe the people and take the power. 
and forget about the promises. It's as simple as that. So how about, how about our role on the other end? You know, you, say, you said at some point that we get the leaders we deserve, right? Yes, absolutely. How about the rest of us who, who also, whether we think differently or not, feed into this system? Because I've also heard people say, when even it's political primaries, even recently in AGSO, people will tell you openly, you know, your cocoa season new because <laughs> you're not game over, so we must get a pound of flesh. Yeah. Now. How about us? Well, that's why, that's why we're sitting here. Us, we are in the minority, like you, you are certainly in the minority, forget it. You know, because the majority of the people, they have myopic minds. They are probably illiterate. They certainly are not discerning. Because anybody who would take even a thousand CDs and sell his or her future, can you understand the person? So if I take thousand now, for the next four years, I'm going to be exploited. My children won't have the right schooling. We won't get the right hospitals. We won't get the right rules to work on. But you still will accept, for, for most of them, 20 CDs, not even a thousand. So one, and democracy is by representation. So if the majority will go that way, then you, you have to follow. It's as simple as that. In terms of, just to wrap on the economic front, resuscitating our economic life, it's not impossible, but how will we get there? Look at the metrics. Inflation has reached a 20 plus year high. You look at the currency. It was coming from 50 something. And the funny thing about that, that's, what, that's when it hits almost 54%. The, the funny thing that people don't, don't understand by inflation is if price go up by 50% and you say inflation is 50%, when you say it's dropped to 40%, it means on top of the 50% which didn't go away, there's another 40% on the whole lot. Mm. So it is not like, oh, we've done well, inflation is dropped from 50 to 40. What are you talking about? Yeah. It doesn't take out the 50%, it's 40% on top of the 150%. That's what it means. And politicians want to brag about it, that we brought inflation down from whatever to whatever. Really? And you haven't increased uh, uh, salaries, people's earning power and everything, and they are still supposed to survive? It's not possible. So it's 20-something percent now. Mm -hmm. um, you have the, the local currency, the CD. As for that, it's almost 15. Yep. I think as of yesterday, it was 14.8 thereabouts, 14.9 to the American greenback, the pound is around 17. Then you look at the other metrics, the cost of living. Just today, you know, um, I mean, we had some interactions on spare parts, prices, and all of that. It is, it's, it's crazy, it's a killer. But is there a way of turning things around and coming back to economic viability to the point where not just the metrics, the macroeconomics, but the microeconomics, the person down there can feel the impact. Okay, that's my take on it. Um, if you are in a bad state as we are, what you do is assess your situation critically. Your, in this case, the resources you have and the potential that you have, and try and raise financing to actually bring out this potential that you have. Unfortunately, and I want to stop here, the loans that we've taken, which is on head of, we don't even see what we use them for. If we use them to probably build solid roads, you can see that with time, food stops, and movement of people will pay for it. The roads but, will pay for themselves. Yeah, but exactly. But when you don't see what the monies have been used for, then it means you're going to a deeper pit. And so, the solution, if you ask me, take prudent loans, strategic loans, or strategic funding. It doesn't all have to be loans. Some of it, you can actually, we have BOTs and BOs and all sorts of things. Construct a road, let them actually take, operate it, and pay for it for some time, and the road becomes yours. It's all there, it's nothing new. So look at your situation and look at the kind of funding which you can employ to take you out of the rut we are in. Mm. Because you certainly need help. But when you go for those uh, funding, and the fundings are not put to the use which they are supposed to do, you want to construct routes. You take a percentage of the money from the contractor. The contractor is owing the banks, you don't pay them on time. 
So they decide that they have to take shortcuts because that's the only reasonable way they can go to be able to survive. So the roads will last two seasons, one, two rainy seasons, and the roads are gone. Roads which are supposed to probably last about 20 years. So it means you throw the money away, but it can't because one, we probably don't negotiate the loans properly. Two, the loans come in and I think there's too much corruption and cutbacks and all sorts of things. So we are shortchanged as in what really gets here. And then when it comes to deploying it, if you are not one of us, we won't give you the contract. So the contract doesn't even go to people who are seasoned, know how to construct property, because they won't pay the amount of money that they want. Right. So they give it to some contractor of theirs who will give them something they have for 20%, if not more. When you've done that, the contractor is now looking at and saying that, ah, they need to I'll deploy maybe 40% of the money I'm getting so I can satisfy you people because you want so much money for me. So the money is really the funding that we get. Don't go to serve the people or don't go into the business and production that you're supposed to provide. And, 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 and. We can sit there the whole day and narrate all these things. And it's, but it's not changing. You find people go into positions and within three, four, five months, they are millionaires. They have four or five cars. They have big houses. The system is not asking them any questions. And we have the right to ask because it's all right to make money. It's all right to have material things. But the state has provided the basic infrastructure for you to thrive to make those money. And therefore, you must pay tax. Right. But if you are not paying tax and just flaunting the money and the government is looking or not asking any questions. I mean, in other jurisdictions, if you use an Aston Martin when you've not, immediately eyes will be on you, exactly. they will check on you. How did you get an exactly. How did you acquire an Aston Martin? What mechanisms do you use? Did you use the right methods? Did you pay tax exactly. on it? It's easy. But here, I guess it's different strokes for different yeah. uh, folks. But talking about leadership and major projects. One just, just came to mind. A lot of people have spoken about it, especially as the NPP administration under President Okufuado is nearing an end. The National Cathedral. What do you think of it? <laughs> is, it is it a 419? Is it a 419? Really? Of course. How can they put state money, the whatever funding that they said they, they had, into uh, 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 putting that pit there? But you want me to uh, have enemies in the government? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm, not, I'm not trying to, get, to create enemies for you. It's fine to mind because you're yeah. talking about roads and other projects. Yeah. And, and, and I just thought, okay, so what we've sunk into that, what if we used it elsewhere? That's why I'm saying it's 419. 419 is when they dupe you of your money, you don't see, get anything out of it. So let's leave it at 419. <laughs> but do you think there's, there's a use we could put that to? In the future, I don't. I think we have to consult architects and things like that. Maybe they could put up some edifice and use the whatever is there as a basement or something. But uh, I don't know. I think some have proposed we could use it as a university. Others as a health, you know, extension of the Greater Accra Regional Hospital. Some say a governance institution to teach young people leadership and all that. I mean, that feeds into what. What you well, doing? Uh, as a matter of fact, I, I, it's better we don't even talk about that pit. <laughs> <laughs> it's better we don't talk about that pit. You refer to it as a pit. But there's also a problem that some Ghanaians have with people like you. Do you know what the problem is? I know. I know. I, I know people can't even stand me. They, I'm sure they'll be sorry that this bank office or high, you know, and so and so forth. But I'm here because, and we're talking about this, because I love Ghanaians and I think we shouldn't be here. But anyway, let me listen to you. <laughs> what, what do they There is that. But there's also the other bit where people feel, if you know all this and you are this capable, especially as someone who led such a big organization, you were what? CEO of the year twice? Was it twice? Uh, six years, uh, three times. Three times. Most respected CEO. Most respected CEO. Yeah. Three times. People like you can do great things. You have done great things, you can. And people will ask, okay, so you talk about the politicians. Why don't you want to? Okay. do something, take the initiative, Thank and you. try to lead. Thank you. So I started a company, good story, with three people in Cantamanto, no money virtually. And we grew it to become a bank with uh, conglomerates. We were in South Africa, we were in India, uh, sorry, sorry, not India, uh, Nigeria. We had uh, UT Live, we had UT Property, we had UT Logistics, a great story. 
stick with him or get out of it. Now, so we hit a bad patch with the banking because uh, we had problems. We go to Bank of Ghana, they try to help. This new government comes, it says, no, we're not bailing you out. Cut. Now, what most people don't know is that when I saw the problems that were coming in the bank, I told my board that, listen, I think I've stayed too long and let's bring a new person. They even opposed it initially. I said, no, no, no. I'm over 60 and I've stayed too long. So almost two years before the bank was closed down, I was not the CEO of UT Bank. You've mentioned that before. Right. right. How many people in Ghana would say that what I created and I can be the CEO until it collapses under me? I said, no, no, no. Please, for the sake of investors, the sake of workers, the sake of the state and everything, I am backing out. And I backed out. Now, when the bank went down, what did they, they do? They killed the bank for whatever reason. They, they, they killed the bank for. I have some idea, but we can't discuss it all, so I won't touch it. They came for me, the guy who resigned two years ago. And during that two years, my board never complained about anything. Bank of Ghana never complained about anything. Two years. But they came for me, went to Yoko, and now I've been in court for four years. If it's not because I am Kofi Amorabin the way I am, they've gagged you for, for life, they have spoiled your reputation, and therefore they must be very, feeling very happy. So to your question, I think I've even <laughs> tried from the coffin which has not been nailed to come out to say, listen, I'm doing something about leadership, and I'm sitting with you trying to talk about the problems. Most people would just say, let me listen to my, go to my court and, and live my small life because whatever I built is being destroyed and my reputation is even being destroyed. But I know within me that I still have something that the country might make use of. That is why I'm venturing out. And I'm sure if you hate me, you won't be too happy about that. I'm going to cry any day in view. But that's, that's up to you. I don't care. I want to do what is good for the system. So. To your people who think maybe uh, I haven't done enough, it's not easy. Mm. Have they thought of how I'm surviving and where I'm even getting funding to build this picking up leadership and picking up scholars? That's the bit I can do. I don't have state money. The state even doesn't want me in the system. That's what it looks like. But I'm still striving. And I tell you, I'm blessed. I'm doing the bit that I can. Do you feel pained? Do no, you feel no. as though you have been robbed of no, your no, no, potential? No, no, no. Your potential. Do you feel you've been robbed of it? In Let me put it this way. Ghana has been robbed of what I could do. Me. Ghana yeah. has been robbed of what, what you I could, could have, have done. done. You see, the thing is, boy from Ukraine to me, raising to a point where I'm most respected, CEO, national award, you name it, all sort of things, John Walker and all that. I think I don't have anything to prove. It's beyond what I thought I could ever do. But with the acquisition of those, the knowledge and the expertise, it didn't come just for the heck of it. What do you do with it for the generation after you? That's what I'm trying to find out. But then what do you do with it when you're carrying all these problems of court and stigma? Because I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm in court for criminal offense, the state versus Prince Kofi Amorabi. And it's going for four years. And I'm saying, no, I can die in a moment. I'm waiting for the court action to end. I may not be able to give back anything. I will just die. So at least I'm venturing out and doing the things that I think the youth will need and give a bit of hope. Because now the problem is, all the youth, when I go to them and I'm talking, the first question or eventual question that you ask is that, would you advise them to stay or go? And it's a painful question because the Ghana that I saw when I was a kid, we're not giving them even a tenth of it. In fact, we're giving them a negative of it. But what I tell them is that, one, I believe there's a creator. And the creator has put you in Ghana for whatever reason. So his plan for you is to change or do something about Ghana. So when you leave, I think you've not been too fair to the creator, unless you're going to study and come back. But that's one side, that's whether you have faith or not. The second thing is, you can be of relevance where there are problems. And of course, Ghana now, we are, we are surrounded by all sorts of problems. So you, as a young person, look for something in the problems to change. 
That's point two. Point three is, if you leave, you will get the same job, most likely, feed yourself, buy a car on credit, um, furnish everything on credit. Live when you're coming on, on holidays, you use your credit card to buy a ticket. When you go by, you're going to do double shift to pay for it. So really, your relevance is limited. But in Ghana, you can, you can actually be of relevance and, and create an impact. You have a chance. So don't throw it away. The final thing I tell them is that I cannot stand living abroad because I'm a fourth class citizen. You come out of your apartment or whatever, even a kid, white kid sees you and he looks at you like he's seen some animal brother. I can't, I can't. And you, yeah. I mean, uh, there was something in Turkey, something, and then they came and they said, Americans out first, and then Europeans out, then uh, Indians and Arabs out. And they left a poor black man there. And so let's stay here and try and change. It's not easy. I was tempted to leave when I left the army in 1982. But after looking around, I said, I will stay. And look at what I was able to build because I stayed. If I had left and I had a job in Salisbury, somewhere in UK, Salisbury, as a bookkeeper, I would have been lost there. But now I'm pensioning, probably married some white old lady. And that will be my fate. So let them stay. But it's not easy. You can't tell everybody to stay. Because right. everybody has got a different tolerance level. And some people cannot let the center hold. And therefore, they may have to go. But we have to give them hope for their own country. Before we get to another crucial point, I just want to find out from you. Mentioning the military brought to mind, I think I recall in your book how you spoke about merely being poisoned at a point way back then. Are there people today that you feel wish you were dead? Wish I was dead? Yes, dead. That I could yeah. feel Yeah. I don't even care. <laughs> I don't think about those things. Honestly, I don't. I don't think negative things. I don't at all. I don't hate anybody. But do, do some people through their actions or inactions show that they wish you were not even here? I won't even see it. <laughs> I wouldn't. I mean, people are supposed to be my enemies or don't like me or I hear stories about them. I still see them. Hi, Charlie, it's saying. It's only three seconds and I'm gone. And you're out of my life. You think I, I have to sit and let that eat me up? No, no, no. Ben, listen. I don't bear grudges. I don't have pain. I always feel blessed. I thank my God. I do things that I think will make God proud of me. And you play golf. I play golf. I play golf a lot. <laughs> Let's talk about this year. It's a crucial one in our yeah. electoral life. We're going to the polls again. And already we've seen some not too pleasant signs. I'm sure you saw recently in or yeah. some of what we saw and a few other things I probably shouldn't mention. But the, even the limited voter registration exercise. Yeah. People toting guns, machetes, <laughs> voter registration, young people. What are your, what do you anticipate? I'm scared, of, I'm scared of it. But I don't waste my time uh, fearing what's going to happen in the future. I live in the present. But I'm scared in the sense that um, I think even though it's not difficult to see that NPP has messed up badly and disappointed Ghanaians, they, they have a lot of money, stolen or whatever, they have a lot of it. And therefore, they will use it to try to stay in power. And that is where my fear comes in, because I think if there's a, an obvious win for NDC, and the MPP are using their money and influence to rig and do all sorts of things, things might explode. Look at uh, talking about the machetes and guns that people are tooting. So we have to pray that for, for whatever reason, the elections go smoothly somehow, and we're able to choose a new leader. And uh, whether it's MPP or NDC, it is what we have. It's better to have peace than anything else. Because our situation, we say, is bad. It's better than being at war. Definitely. Exactly. So let's thank God for his mercies. Let's try and pray for things to calm down. But certainly, we're going through a lot of hardships. And the change is not going to be very smooth. I mean, it's not as if MPP will give it to NDC. NDC will have to fight for it. 
and already you see like what is happening with the Jews when they raise. It is scary, so we need to pray and hope for the best. But it shouldn't put us in a, a, a state of paralysis as saying we don't know what to do or we're not going to work hard and we have to work hard for it. There are two things that come to mind from there. The rhetoric from both of our major parties. The president has sounded like the only person I practically will be handing over to is my VEEP, the flag bearer of his yeah. party. Then you hear the chairman of the NDC also say the MPP should gear up to hand over power peacefully in their own interest. It's almost like <laughs> jabs, a, a game of darts. You throw, and then, I throw. And then, I forgot one, and Brian, <laughs> Brian at some point said, never. Yeah. Would never. That, that, that so makes it. for very cold comfort, doesn't yeah. it? Yeah. it? That's why I'm saying it's scary. But uh, I'm sure, at the end of the day, that's why when you have faith in your creator, it makes life easier. At the end of the day, this world is for the Creator. Mm. And He will let what will happen happen. So we shouldn't be too scared as to what is going to happen. It will happen uh, not with God's blessing as such, but it means I will take it that if it happens, then that's the way He wants it. Therefore, we take it like that. So your faith is He will order things, no matter how they turn out, He will order it. As He wishes. As He wishes. Ah, his will will always be done. Mm. And you know, one, talking about that, one thing that reminds me of that, we are suffering now because we are bad people. Ghanaians are suffering now yeah, yeah, because yeah. we are bad generally, people. Generally, we are bad people. So when you are generally bad, I don't think God will give you a leader who will come and just liberate you. He says, Trahoka Krana, Sofa Kakra. Oh, really? <laughs> but there is really, it took over 400 years before he bailed them out and took them out. Trahoka <laughs> Sofa Kakra. That's what it's like. <laughs> we are generally bad people. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. What yeah, makes yeah. the Ghanaian generally We are bad? evil. I tell you, so many instances. We don't love ourselves. We hate each other. Petty jealousies. I have a lot of examples. I see it happening every day. I never understand. <laughs> Listen, give two friends. Let me say, there are two, we have to use that example. There are two beggars. I won't say where they are, but otherwise you see them. And they've been there for 30, 40 years. One day I gave one of them. I had 20 cities to give to them. And they become my friends. I know their names and everything. So I gave 20 cities to one of them. I said, Uni Unia, Uni Unia. And I just checked the mirror. And he was, he was hiding the 20 cities from that guy that he's been sitting there for the past 30 years begging. What kind of mindset is that? You didn't work for it. You know both of you are my friends. I tell you that you and your brother. He said he did from him. So you think if he does that, then how can you blame the president or those in power? It's the same life. Here, yeah. we are evil, we don't love ourselves, we are jealous, and I was explaining to people that, listen, we must understand why we, who we are as Africans before we try and find solutions. Because time will not allow, all I'll tell you is that the African is, 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 um, is capable of excelling in life because we go outside and we excel. Right. Now, the re only reason why we excel is due to two things. One, we get out of our toxic environment. And by toxic environment, I mean environment where decisions and appointments and whatever are taken because somebody's my brother, he's my friend, he's a family member, he's my tribe, that's the politics and all that. And also, uh, influenced by where the person worships, um, who his chiefs are, and which party he belongs to. That's a very toxic environment because the systems don't work. Now the Ghanaian or the African moves out of that toxic system and goes into a system where things work. Mm. Don't pack a double yellow line. Your fine is maybe 50 cities. Even the king will not pack there. And under those circumstances where the system is working, then you see the potential of the African. So really, the prescription for us is harsh application of the systems. Harsh. 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 Where harsh means Harsh means, what is your bitch? And you are not looking. <laughs> you are not looking who, and nobody can influence you. I mean, really, I, I, I sacked my brother at some point. You sacked? Yeah. I was working with him, and I had to sack him. As in, you, 
at the UT. And the end, you sacked him. Yeah. And mm -hmm. then my Busia Penning came. A lot of people came, but my Busia came. I looked at and I said, listen, I was a penning. I think it's better that you, you take me out of the Busia because uh, I can't <laughs> get him back. Then I looked at and I said, listen, the money I'm giving you now, do you know that if this guy works in the company, when you come here, I'll be broke. Or you will spoil the company and I can't give you money. So why do you want me to employ him? And it's about merit, it's about sanctioning. But what do we have? Interference from our chiefs, interference from our pastors, interference from family and friends, interference from politicians. So we can't let a system work. So the system that, and system, they don't exist in a vacuum. As soon as you kick out the good system, the bad system comes in. And we've got a bad system taking over the, what is the right system. So somebody is, uh, has money in their homes or whatever, and the president says, oh, yeah, it's okay. Why even express an uh, opinion about it? And you know you are the president. Don't say anything. Let the systems work. Mm. But we don't. And that's why we have the problem. But if the African is governed by harsh systems and no consideration, no interference, I tell you, it won't take even six months for everybody to see that we are on the right track. Just, just to dwell briefly on the electoral year, what are your expectations of our electoral commission? I'm sure you've heard of the trade-offs from time to time and the accusations, but also the good work they are doing. What are your expectations of I, the mental I haven't head bothered head? to really look at the work of the EC, but my fears, you know, I'm a finance guy, my fears is that if uh, the CD to the dollar is now $50 and we are just about getting to election, and the records are there, every time we go to election, the, uh, there's a huge uh, devaluation of the city, or the city depreciates against the dollar. So I wouldn't be surprised if the city by the end of the year is hovering around 1820. 18? Yeah. 20? Unless there's zero interference. Did you so, say 20? Yes. 20 we cities are 15, to the dollar. We are 15 in May, and we are heading towards the uh, election. And of course, there will be that time where the MNCs will repatriate their funds It'll, it'll hamper this, the spending that comes with elections. And your forecast is that if all of the, those come to bear, we could go that high? Exactly. And I'm not someone who's uh, noted for uh, wrong predictions. You know, so we, as I said, of course the government will try to put some interventions. You see, the problem with the CD and the dollar is we are depending on imports too much. It's as simple as that. Mm. And our exports are going down. Now even cocoa exports are going down. And people are leaving the farms and things like that. And the ground same money is cry, most of it we don't even see. Mm. So under those circumstances, you can never have a currency that is strong. It will never happen. And when people talk about the evolution of the CD and the period of the CD, at my age, I've seen the CD, not even when I was a kid. I was an army officer at the time retired. In 1983, it was 2.75 old CDs to a dollar. Well, you could even come to the Fourth Republic. There was a time when it was almost one-to-one, -one, when we re-denominated no, no, forget about that one -to -one. our currency under Kufo. That, that, that's a gimmick. Listen, so if you take that re-denomination off, it means from 83 to now, it's gone from 2.75 to a dollar to 150,000 to a dollar. Can you put a mind to it? That's what it is. So it will always, I mean, it will always go down. Because we don't have the structures and infrastructure and the plans and the strategy to address it holistically. But, but even talking about that holistic approach, just briefly on that, the international system itself, and even pegging currencies to the dollar and all of that, is it not hugely skewed against economies like ours? I think you use uh, uh, a, fever, a favorable word as in what they're doing to us. Because any time we go to IMF and World Bank, social adjustment program, the two things that they do is sell off your companies. First thing is the state companies. Private companies can't say sell off. But why wouldn't they uh, uh, advise them to close down a company like UT Bank, which is helping Ghanaians to build their company and things like that. So it's not in their interest. And the precision is, al is always sell off companies and devalue your currency which makes 
our goods cheaper. And that's always the prescription. And our governments always swallow it. So unless we look into ourselves and take pragmatic action to reduce, initially it should be harsh. I would say that reduce imports or cut imports, certain things shouldn't even be imported at all. Mm. Because in our homes, I want to eat <coughs> a, a jollof, but I'm in Nisika. Some of our a friend is saying, uh, uh, when I have money, I, I will eat my jollof. So why is it that we're being forced under WTO and all sorts of things to import things that we cannot pay for? Right. I don't get it. I mean, as a simple person, I simply don't get it. And our governments always agree and they can't take positive action. I will tell WTO, whoever, me ni a more important view, because me ni sika. Me ni bi, me, me, me tell me come around that, me import to the NID. Now, such a simple action, what would be the effect? Local rice price will go up. People will now go into rice production aggressively. Because the price is high, some people cannot afford rice, so they will go for plantain, go for cassava, go for hukukuyam. The price will go up. People will go to the farm. Do you see it? It is not. I don't know why we don't apply the knowledge we have and the common sense that we have. Maybe I'm. I, I rather don't have the, the knowledge and common sense. Maybe. I'm not saying I know it all, but when I don't sleep, it's just the way Ghana is going. No, what you're saying is very practical economics, and countries that have made it started exactly from there. You can look at China. They looked inward before looking outward. But I'm curious about something. There's also word on the street. For a long time, people have said, after the UT episode, he must be broke. Everything has gone down. He's probably even, I've even heard people, I'll tell you today, saying that you probably now have to sponge off people to eat. What is the reality? Also clarify for me. Um, some say the, the night before you, the UT episode, the shutdown, you spoke to former finance minister, Ken Ofriata. He called me, yeah. You spoke to him? Yeah, but not about the bank. But not about the bank? No. He said nothing about it? No. And the next day they were shutting you down. Yeah, absolutely. What's your relationship like with him? Uh, no, he doesn't want to see me, so I don't see him. He doesn't want to see you? No. Why? Um, well, I want to see him. Initially, I want to see him, and I said, Oh, yeah, what's happening? I don't understand. And, you know, this is a time I need my brother to help and things. At one point, he said, His PA should give me his number so that when I need him, I'll call the PA. Certainly, he didn't want to see me. I mean, you don't, I don't, you don't have to stretch it. But for those who are saying I'm broke, I'm broke, is it any of their business? I'm broke as well. I'm broke as well. Crowdfunding, they are broke already. Nonsense. I don't have time for those people. <laughs> you know? But um, I think when you do good and you are clear in your mind, somehow God will take care of you. I've never been in a dire situation and things like that. In fact, initially, some of my friends thought I would commit suicide. I said, well, madam, this world is very sweet, pal. Me, I'm going to live here, and I'm praying to God that I get a longer life and see the end of all these things that are happening. Because God used me to a very good level. I impacted people's lives. And then he's changed his plan. So I should disappoint him. I said, no, no. You know when I pray, I ask God, God, please, what is next? Because certainly you must have something to let me go through this. And there's something to that, you know. People who say they have faith, they, have they, they, they don't even understand their faith. The biggest uh, 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 test, you know who God gave it to? His own son. He's somebody disappointed him. <laughs> oh, no, no. They would have disappointed him. So he gave it to his own son. That's why he knew. Even his son was an Aubrey. So, when you have all these, uh, what do you call it, tribulations or whatever, or, or, or downturn and all those things, it's up to you to stand firm because God is sending a message, is sending lessons around, and you must stand firm to let people learn from it and share it. Mm. But if someone says that, so is it right here? I don't know. I don't know what he wants. <laughs> you know, it's like when I was 
in my big house before, and when I left the bank and I realized that things were not going right, I sold a big house and moved into an apartment. Somebody came and said, Kofi. Are, are you referencing the one in Roman Ridge? Yeah, Roman Ridge. Right. So someone came, a friend, close, they said, Kofi, no, 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 this one I can't say. If you sell, they say you are broke. I said, who will say? He said, well, they. I said, who and who? He said, I said, I said, my name is Wei Jimmy, sir. Of course I'm broke, and I don't want to live here. It's too expensive to live here. And I don't even fit into this place, because it's too big. And I moved, and it's my life. And I don't care what anybody is saying. If you want to bring me money, and you are saying that, oh, you are no broke, so I, I won't send it. Then I will tell you maybe what I'm broke, therefore bring the money or not. But you don't have anything to add to my life, and you say, well, broke. So what? Of course, uh, I'm in a situation where God is great because I'm paying legal fees. I have to take care of myself. I take care of my grandchildren and things like that. So it's been good, and can't ask for more. It's all in God's time. All in God's time. Before I take your tips for survival in these times, I think a brain like yours would be able to. These are hard times, and you've been there, done that, but. Uh, there's also this, just in about a minute, this LGBTQI bill <laughs> and, and all the conversations about it. In, in simple terms, what do you make of it? Are we just wasting our time talking about the unnecessary or is it something that really deserves ah. our attention? Sam George is my friend and I know where he's coming from. I think personally, forget it, uh, uh, forget it, personally, I don't mind what people want to do with their lives and in their own private areas. Mm. I think the anger or all these things are coming to the fore because they want to tell us that is even better than the natural uh, form of uh, existence. That is where it's required that people take a stand and fight it because it's affecting the nucleus family and the control by the kids and so on and so forth. So if you prefer something that I can't stand, it's your choice, right. but don't come and tell me that mm -hmm. uh, if you don't uh, come out, we will even give you aid. I mean, for good, that's what I'm talking about. So then take it, let me die. Uh, for, for me to take that, what I don't want, leave me to die. So my position is that I, I don't have anything against it. I don't at all, but if they, they should keep it to themselves. Okay, let's talk about your tips for survival, especially the very young people who would be watching this, who want to walk in your shoes someday. Yeah, they will suffer. Uh, <laughs> no pain, no gain. Your now, tips. I, I, I get this question about resilience and things. I guess you're talking about the same thing. Number one, believe, have faith. Believe in something. Because you see, um, anything that is created uh, anything that exists must have been created. I don't believe Big Bang and all those things, you know, I think it's who are. But then the question is, who created? You don't know. But once it exists, it has been created. Now, the only reason why anything or anybody will create something is because he expects that creation to better things. So if you have a problem, you create something and say, I'll probably use it to solve the problem. So we've all been put in this world, and we are on, on a mission. And the mission is to make the world a better place. That's why the Creator put us here, to make His creation better. So find it, and do it right, and make the world a better place. That's the first thing. It makes you God-fearing, therefore you can accept situations, and say maybe this is what God wants, and what do I do out of this? Right. So you are not too mad at things, Certainly you won't commit suicide. You can have the, the, the wherewithal to stand challenges because you know that there's a God who has a purpose for you and will take you out when he wants you to go out, not when somebody wants to take you out. So the first thing is have faith in, 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 in God and in creation. The second thing is do not be defined by material things. You know, you need material things, worldly things, to survive and to lead seemingly a better life. So it's good to have money. It's good to have maybe properties, cars, a house. It's good to fall in love. Um, it's good to have children. But really, really, they're all worldly things. 
And as we all know, you came without those things and you die without those things. But you need them whilst you're trying to impact the world positively for life to be meaningful and for you not to suffer too much. But a lot of people get defined by these worldly things to the point that somebody's love or wife or girlfriend dies and their life is virtually ended. I sold somebody's house and he told me that if I sold that house, he would die. I said, then prepare to die unless you bring my money. <laughs> and don't laugh. And I sold the house. And he died. So I said, ah, this guy was a prophet and I was joking with him like that. He died. <laughs> you know? So, <laughs> this is a serious matter, you. <laughs> as a fact. Okay. So, because. So the person took a loan and. So, because he said, if I sell the property, if he doesn't, <laughs> he wasn't paying, if I sell the property, he would die. I should. Say, then don't die, take the property and don't pay the money. I just want, see, I went by the system. If you don't pay, we have your collateral. It will be sold. The money is put back for the depositors. Then you say, if you sell it, I will die. I say, so I told you, I said, prepare to die. Unless you bring my money. And he didn't bring the money. And we sold. And he died. <laughs> I repeat. And I said, the guy was a prophet. I should have taken him more seriously. Anyway, so... Do not be defined by material things. I see politicians, so-called rich people, having a lot of houses, a lot of cars. Some of the cars, I don't even see the sense in riding them around. If you go and buy a car, that's about this from the road, with all the ramps here. I mean, really. You could do something to impact this world with those monies and not show off as in property that you have. You don't need that much to lead a decent life. Right? My life now, people will say that. So after all this, why are you now struggling, even trying to travel with people and trying to build a leadership foundation and things like that? I want my life to be meaningful and I want to die empty. Whatever I have acquired in this world, it should come out before I die. I don't want to die with all sorts of things within me that I didn't share. You know. So going back, have a great faith. Don't let material things define you and have great value. Love people and have humility. Because you know, then this world we are about eight billion. Ghana, we are about thirty five million. You are only one. One over eight billion. Can you do that math? So in other words, you are zero. <laughs> it's as simple as that. You ain't worth anything. So what, what are you trying to prove? Be humble and love people and make sure that your presence here impacts on people's life. And that's all you should look at. Fear your God. Don't get some material things. Definitely get it. But when you get it, it's not to show off that I'm this and I had this because you leave it behind. But get it and use it to impact the world positively. I mean, in America, somebody uh, donated one billion to pay for uh, medical fees that were outstanding or something like that. One billion, just give it out. Look at the impact. She worked so hard, earned the money, and said, I'll use it to help these people. But here, what do we use the money for? We steal it. The worst thing, we even take it out of our country to put in other people's countries. What have we done, Ghana? Well, <laughs> uh, it's been so insightful. <laughs> Sometimes, if you want to contemplate Ghana, you you, you will not understand. But really nice. Thanks. Any day. It's been a great pleasure uh, interacting with you today. Thank you for welcoming us into your space, and thank you for the pearls of wisdom that you've shared with us uh, today. This has been my interaction with. I told you he needs no introduction, and I love how he frees his mind. Uh, he, I don't know whether he will accept to be called a business mogul now, maybe even a philanthropist, <laughs> uh, but definitely a leader. Captain Prince Kofi Amwabe retired. This has been AM Exclusive with me, Benjamin Akaku. Thank you for watching. I'm in the TV. Now, so far, so good. Say, so, open okay, online portal, a work Ghana. Ah, you can share, you can follow, you can comment here. To my best of knowledge, 
without any biases. I append to TV. <laughs>